Supposing I have, a, I'm an alchemist, and I have a whole secret closet full of love filters, very potent ones. And if I see a desirable woman, all I have to do is to offer her a cigarette or give her a glass of wine with one of my secret potions in it. And instantly, I'm her master. Now, what, when I think that through, what would I do with a situation like that? <laughs> because all I've got again is that plastic doll that when I push it, it does what I tell it to and doesn't have any comeback. What you always are looking for in things is where the surprise is there, where there's a comeback. And you say, my God, this thing is alive. It has a will of its own. It is not in my control. And I would like to have a relationship with something like that, because it would never be dull. And also, uh, you would feel uh, true affection. Uh, after all, you, you, you can make love to yourself in a mirror. You can uh, have a, one of those Dutch wives. You buy them in a place in Kobe, where you get these rubber girls that you fill with hot water. <laughs> And uh, the sailors take them on long voyages. But what an awful thing, you know, when you realize that this thing has no gear, uh, no surprise in it, no thing that it does on its own, you see. It is common in France to get a young woman really aroused, you know, and she will say, kill me, kill me, kill me, kill me, as if to know, to go as far as you can in throwing yourself away to somebody else. You know, do anything you want to. And in that abandon, you see, there is the possibility that this, an undulation of feeling, which is total orgiastic feeling, may take over. And in that feeling, you see, you are one with what is happening completely. And that's what everybody, as it were, finally aspires to. You, for example, never force other people to agree with you, but you give them the notion that the idea you wanted them to have was their own. This is a feminine heart, preeminently. <laughs> a, a woman who really wants a lover does not pursue him because then most men feel that she's aggressive and if she's aggressive she obviously is a woman who has had difficulty in finding lovers and therefore there must be some undesirably secret thing about her but if she as it were makes a void then uh, and, and is slightly difficult to get then people get excited they know she's a highly prized object, and uh, so they pursue. There are jugglers. There are very beautiful people. That's pretty astonishing when you pick out someone and say, gee, isn't she gorgeous? And that's done without thinking. <laughs> and uh, it, it embarrasses many women to be told that they're beautiful because they want to be admired for their intellectual achievements rather than for the bodies which their parents provided for them. Uh, all spiritual people are generally against lovemaking. Ramakrishna used to speak about the evils of woman and gold. I've already demonstrated the evils of gold. <laughs> but what about the evils of woman? In my point of view, Yes, women can be a source of evil if you attempt to possess them. I mean, if you can say of another person, I love you so much I want to own you, and really tie you down, and uh, call you... Well, it's like that poem of Ogden Nash, where someone uh, claimed that he loved his wife so much that he climbed a mountain and named it after her. Called it Mount Mrs. Oswald Tregenis. 
<laughs> and so, in other words, if you, if you try to possess people and you make your sexual passion possessive in that way, then, of course, you are trying to cling to the physical world. But you see, women are in a way much more interesting if you don't cling to them. If you let them be themselves and be free. And uh, in, in my opinion, you can have a very spiritual sex life if you are not possessive. But if on the other hand you are possessive, then you're in trouble. So, uh, but I, but you know, uh, the, the average Swami won't uh, agree with that because he confuses he by thinking that the body the body that I touch is something evil he's hung up with it it's like the story of the two Zen monks who were crossing a river and uh, it was uh, the ford was very deep because of the flood and there was a girl trying to get across and one of the monks immediately picked her up threw her over his shoulder and carried her across, put her down on the other side, and then they, the monks went one way and she went another. And uh, the other monk had been in a kind of embarrassed silence, and which he finally broke, and he said, do you realize that you broke a monastic rule by touching and picking up a woman like that? And he said, oh, but I left her on the other side of the river and you're still carrying her. Uh, uh, we know too, that uh, social institutions govern what we notice. An American male pays relatively little attention to the back of a girl's neck. And it's perfectly okay for her to grow her hair down long and cover it. But to a Japanese, the je back of a girl's neck is the most exciting sexual feature. And so when you see a well-dressed Japanese girl, her kimono hangs a little bit down the back like this, exposing her neck. They pay no attention, though, uh, to breasts, uh, which seem to so fascinate the American male. They, they, they just, it just doesn't seem to appear. And the way that a traditional Japanese woman clothes herself is uh, exposing the neck, but looking very flat in front, and not at all showing the hips. She is willowy. <clears throat> she doesn't look very willowy underneath, as a rule, but uh, she does when dressed in a kimono. Now, so you see, uh, it isn't just that nature has built in to the human organism certain attractive features about other people. It's the social institution of what is to be attractive. And, of course, this comes out very, very strongly in the vagaries of fashion and how to do one's hair, paint one's face, etc., etc. When we had birth problems, see, all women used to think that birth had to be painful. It was good for them. It was one of the things you had to suffer because you'd been, you'd been screwing around with people and therefore you, <laughs> you, you had to have a child and it's got to hurt. And... Uh, then the doctors got together and they scratched their heads and the man called Granty Dick Reed said, no, birth doesn't hurt, it's natural. You know, all you've got to do is to talk these women into the idea that it doesn't hurt, that all these so-called pains are just tensions and that uh, birth is great. It's not a disease. It's not really something you ought to go to hospital for because you associate hospitals with diseases and sickness. Birth isn't sickness. So, you must remember, of course, that the word play and the word game have many levels of meaning. We are accustomed to use the word play in opposition to work and to regard play as trivial and work as serious. Very largely, a game or a play is something in, associated in our minds with triviality. You're only playing with me, says a girl to a suitor. You're not serious. How serious do you have to be? 
When does one get serious in a flirtation? When do we say this is getting serious? When you're holding hands, playing footsies under the table, kissing, petting, sleeping together, married and babies. Maybe that's serious. <laughs> well, she, first of all, feminine, represents what is called philosophically the negative principle. Now, of course, people who are women in our culture today and believe in women's lib don't like to be associated with the negative because the negative has acquired very bad connotations. We say accentuate the positive. Well, that's a purely male chauvinistic attitude. How would you know that you were outstanding unless, by contrast, there was something instanding? <laughs> you cannot appreciate the convex without the concave. You cannot appreciate the firm without the yielding. And therefore, the so-called negativity of the feminine principle is obviously life-giving and very important. I mean, let's just take uh, our notions of um, feminine beauty. They're entirely uh, fabricated by some curious creeps who edit Vogue magazine and Harper's <laughs> Bazaar to make stuffed dummies who, uh, um, when actually encountered, are about as um, comfortable as falling into the middle of a bicycle. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, poor women, they're always having to live up to the image of some movie star or somebody who is the great type of the day. They feel their husbands will be disappointed if they don't look like that. And that's because we set up these ideal external surface forms of beings, having no sensitivity to the substance, to the weight, to the volume, to the temperature, and above all to the smell.